So one of the common misperceptions that I hear from CFOs when I talk to them as part of the networks that I'm in is I hear statements like, but it's a third world or a developing economy type of challenge. It's actually not. It's also very much a developed economy problem. How do you keep track to make sure that they're being treated fairly and being paid a living wage? So welcome, David. Thank you for joining me today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me, Em. <laughs> We've spoken so many times and in so many different capacities. Um, we met at an event in London pre-COVID. Actually, I think it was almost five years ago um, and kind of kept in touch over over time. So really excited to have you here and excited to uh, hear about a lot of things from a business perspective. But before we do get down to business, I'd love to hear a little bit more about you. Um, and curious if you can tell us a little bit about one of your hobbies. Great question. I have a few. So it, it perhaps is a little bit more about picking which one or which couple. So a few that I like to do. So beyond being a finance guy and, and loving that, I love scuba diving. My wife and I go scuba diving all around the world. We absolutely love it. Our favorite place to dive is in Indonesia. The, uh, yeah, the country has fantastic protective laws in their marine parks. So they've done a really phenomenal job at protecting marine life. So you see some really, really interesting marine scapes, which is absolutely fascinating. Beyond that, I love drawing and painting. So I have an artistic side, which is probably pretty good because if we're going to be creative, better to do it in the context of art than in the context of accounting and finance. And I also love leadership and helping people and helping people look at things differently or perhaps approaching things in a different way. So I've a few, some of them a little bit more business-like and some definitely much more hobby-like. Yeah, exactly. And I can see you have an um, adventurous side, um, a very calming side, and then probably a, I would say a passionate side because I think since you and I have met, um, you and I have really gotten into some really great discussions around that, um, which I think is going to come through here today while we chat. Absolutely. Um, but I love all of those, and I'm really envious of the scuba diving. It's something I've always wanted to do and not yet done, so I think i got to dive into that. So another question that I have, post-COVID, are you in the office? Are you working remotely? Are you hybrid? What does that look like for you? The company is hybrid. The environment for most people actually in the countries I tend to visit for business tends to be hybrid. I think there's probably about 30 to 40 percent of companies that I see that allow employees a complete choice. So fully remote, hybrid or fully in the office. I don't see too, too many companies, to be honest, that are fully in the office, but they absolutely do exist. And we hear sometimes the CEOs of some of those companies start to talk about wanting to be back in the office five days a week. So it's an interesting model at the moment. And, and one, to be fair, from my perspective, I think has changed forever. That's my personal view. I agree. I mean, people have literally moved their homes over COVID and now don't actually live near one of those offices. So it's an interesting sort of uh, answer that I get across the board when asking that question. The follow-up to that is, when you are remote, where is your desk? So is it in an office? Is it at your kitchen table? Is it a patio? What does that look like? It's a great question. I wish I could say it was on a beach because that would be <laughs> the panacea and the ideal. Uh, sadly, it's not. It's in an office, so it's a home office. To be fair, I think it's, for me, and, and maybe this is part of the profession, I like having that structure. I like having that ability to go into the room I'm, and I'm in a business mindset and then when I'm finished, I close the door and I'm at home. So I really do like that differentiation from that perspective. So it tends to be office, but yes, definitely wish I could say beach or garden or just something <laughs> like that. But that doesn't seem really practical. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I also am in a, a home office as well, but you can't beat the commute, I guess. <laughs> oh, absolutely right. And here we are with this, you know, this great setup that we've both got at home know, and, and allowing us to do this here today. I know. We're very lucky. Um, okay, next question. And it's one I ask every guest. Um, is How do you think of the end-to-end the -end or the holistic 
say, revenue process? Do you think of it as order to revenue, quote to cash, quote to revenue? I've heard a a recent one um, from a, a guest on our podcast refer to it as lead to reporting. How do you think of it and how do you refer to it? None of those things, to be honest, I refer to it as lead to ca- lead to cash. Lead to so, cash. Okay. Yes, I have heard though lead to reporting, so it's the one step further. So that I think is is probably a really good way of looking at it. But lead to cash is what I've always known it as. I, I know. I think I'm that lead to reporting one has kind of gotten me thinking. It does feel far more comprehensive. Um, so I may have to steal that one and start using it as well. <laughs> Indeed. But the interesting (laughs) thing with that one, and in all of these terms, it's within the company. But if we think about it from a broader perspective, it would actually be from lead to consumption and consumption of the data, not just the reporting of the data. So going one step further and thinking about those stakeholders as well. I like that. See, we'll add another one to the list. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so um, fun stuff out of the way. Also more, uh, also fun, but a little bit more on yourself. Tell me about um, some of your current work, what you're interested in, what it is that you're working on, and and what motivates you around that. Great question. Um, there are a few things I absolutely love doing. One of them is finance transformation projects. So I've done finance transformation over the years, really relooking at how companies can manage certain uh, finance processes. And certainly mm-hmm. one of the ones that I looked at a few years ago was how to transform the RevRec function. So in the context of a multinational, how do you take it from a decentralized model to one that had structure where it was organizationally centralized, but people-wise and human-wise still very much decentralized, Mm -hmm. but matrixed within the context of the country, the businesses, et cetera. So that, uh, that kind of project I absolutely love doing. I also have a significant passion for leadership So I do a fair amount of leadership development, particularly for finance individuals, you know, helping them with mindset, way of thinking. How do you deal with difficult conversations? How do you deal with pushback from the business when there's a lot of pressure and stand up to that kind of pressure, which is a very real uh, challenge that both you and I have dealt with in our careers, certainly. (laughs) Yes. And then and I think beyond finance, the other thing I really love doing is getting involved and being involved in sustainability. So helping companies think about sustainable businesses. So it's beyond the reporting for ESG. It's really thinking about the business model. You know, how do we look at that business model in the context of not just the environment, but the social environment within which we operate? So the people, the communities, and then the governance side, where does the governance fit in? Because again, as finance people, we really like this kind of structure. We understand it. We can relate to it. And it's about how we capitalize on the skill sets we have and help the business transition to where we need to go. Because the the fact of the matter is, is we live within a planet with boundaries. So how do we make sure that we operate within those planetary boundaries? Because, you know, we all need to make sure that we can sustain not just ourselves, but our families, our friends, the future generations that aren't here yet, and make sure that we're leaving them with something to enjoy as we've done. I love that. And we're going to dive into that a little bit more. Really excited to get into that um, based on some past conversations you and I have have had and things that I want to dive into with you. Um, Before we get there, though, you've mentioned um, that your personal philosophy is contributing to business growth and then making a positive difference to people, which I couldn't even hear as you've started to kind of talk about the things that you're passionate about, um, things that you're interested in. Can you dive into that a little bit deeper for us? Yeah, absolutely. I think it started a few years ago. So there's a couple of things that I think have happened. You know, we all go through life events, life changes. Some of them are very positive. Some of them are very difficult. And the question then becomes, well, how do we take those experiences and make them something really constructive and positive? I tend to be an optimistic guy. I tend to see the possibilities in everything, to be honest. Um, My wife would tell you sometimes I should probably look a little bit more at the risks. I'm very fortunate she helps do that for me. So I think, you know, when you've got a partnership like that, it's great and it works really well. But it's this idea of, you know, how do we take what we've done and the benefits that we've had over the years? How do we make sure that we give some of that back? And whether you call it pay it forward or, or whatever nomenclature you give it, How do you make sure that you do that? So I think a big part of the passion for me 
is making sure that that's part of something I don't lose sight of ever. And that I think about how to bring that to life for individuals who are starting their career, who perhaps are mid-career thinking about a change, or individuals that are looking to transition to a completely uh, different phase of their life. And that's a big part of, I think, how I've lived my life for many, many years now. Uh, it's a big part of how you and I met and how we continue the connections. It, you know, I think that's part of it, is how do you make sure that ultimately connections that you make become ones that are beneficial to both? as opposed to one-sided. We meet many people in life. Sometimes the individuals we meet tend to be uh, individuals that take more, and sometimes they're individuals that give more. And I think it's really nice to be an individual who gives more because those tend to be the relationships that are the most meaningful in life. And ultimately, whether that's in business or whether that's in personal life, that's you know ultimately, I think, what matters because the, the things that we accumulate, for example, over life, we can't take them with us, but the relationships, the memories, the experiences we absolutely have forever. David, this is why I love talking to you. <laughs> You're always such a <laughs> breath of fresh air. <laughs> it always feels good. You're always so positive. I, I really enjoy it. Um, so you have a strong history of collaboration within the finance space, right? You and I, I've seen you with other folks as well. Um, you work with different organizations. You mm -hmm. author books. I mean, it's all so impressive. Um, and a lot of the work you're doing right now is centered around um, leading and mentoring teams and individuals. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about what you're doing and why that's important to the field? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll share maybe two stories to give perhaps two different perspectives. So one of the things I do in the context of, of organizations and, and particularly in the context of um, kind of day to day is really looking at how I help accelerate the career of younger employees. So these are individuals perhaps who have finished university, they're in their first, let's say five years of work, and they're trying to find their feet as we all did back in the day, but we sometimes forget how difficult it was to build a network, how difficult it is to be able to create connections and patterns between, for example, contracts to commercial transactions, to market behaviors, to competitive behaviors. And it's about how we teach individuals to be able to do that more quickly. Because I think certainly from my perspective, I would have had, um, I think, the ability to progress even faster if mm -hmm. I had known that. And if I had had someone that would have mentored me through that, I think the career path would have happened much faster than it did. Don't get me wrong. I've had a fantastic career. I don't regret a thing. But it's the time. It's how do we end up really accelerating that time and I think about it more from the perspective of not so much moving up to a job title level, but more from the standpoint of we live a, a, a finite work life. How do we make sure that we have the time to do many different things and not necessarily stay in one area so that we can have greater impact, whether that's in different functions, different industries, whatever the case may be. So the acceleration is more about how we provide that additional value more quickly but also more broadly. So that's probably one perspective. The, the other area that I really like, the second example I'll give you, and this is one I have to be honest, is probably got me the most excited in the last few years is really, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, sustainability. I've done some work over the last couple of years on how we bring digital to sustainability reporting, and more importantly, how we connect sustainability reporting or ESG reporting, as many refer to it as, how do we connect that to financial reporting? How do we make sure that those things are integrated and that we're making decisions on a holistic basis? We're not where we need to be collectively at the moment. So part of the work I do is around how we accelerate that. And then I get into specific topics and, and one that I'm really uh, quite excited about at the moment is looking at modern day slavery and human trafficking and really thinking about it from the perspective of what can companies do, CFOs do, to really make a difference in the context of not just their own operation, but the supply chain more broadly. Because, and you might ask me, well, why it, this particular topic? Why this particular issue? And it's because there are numerous studies by NGOs that show virtually 100% of supply chains around the world have some form of modern slavery somewhere. So it means that there isn't a company 
that's immune from this when it comes down to multinationals or multi-jurisdictional companies, anyone that's dealing with suppliers. So how do we then step up and take our expertise and help the organization to develop due diligence programs and supplier uh, programs so that we can start to make a tangible difference and eradicate this process? This is definitely something that I wanted to make sure we touched on. It's something that you've seen in in the market with various companies and particularly around that modern slavery and the corporate perspective. I'm, I'm hoping you can give some tangible examples of that because when you and I spoke about this probably over a month ago, um, and you know, I, it caused me a, a great deal of pause because it wasn't the way I was thinking of things. And I would love to have you give some of those examples that you had given to me on what that actually means and, you know, the context of what's actually happening out there and the, the different forms that that modern slavery comes in. It is a great question. And you're absolutely right. Sometimes we don't realize what's happening. And sometimes it's the lack of awareness that causes the lack of action. Mm-hmm. So I'll give a couple of examples. And certainly these are not exhaustive by any stretch of imagination. There are sadly far too many practices. But let me give a couple that I think uh, might be helpful to bring this to life. I was talking to a professor in India, as it happened, a few weeks ago, not very long ago. And we were talking about child labor. And the story he relayed to me was this. So he's done a lot of outreach and work within the context of the country to really understand where, let's say, regions are or where various industries are and how they're thinking about it. And the example he gave me was in the context of making rugs. And there are particular areas in India that are very, very famous for making rugs and make absolutely beautiful rugs. And what he described to me was the situation where he and another a group of people were walking around looking at practices in the context of the rug making industry and looking at how it was being done. And he observed very young children making them. And the question that was raised, and and here's where it gets really interesting and, and why I share this story is to really help us understand how different cultures think about these things very differently. And when we talk about it, the response was, no, 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 we, we don't have child labor. We have uh, individuals that we're teaching a trade to. So these are basically apprentices. So when you start to think about it in that context, if you've got geographies and organizations that think of it more as an apprenticeship, then how do you end up dealing with that as an organization? Because if we think about it perhaps from whether it's an American point of view or a European point of view, we would say apprentices, okay, these are individuals that have finished high school and they're typically going on beyond high school. So we have a perspective on what an apprentice is. It's described differently in different jurisdictions. So it's really important to understand that context. A couple of other examples that were given as well. If you think about, for instance, the context of working in whether it's the apparel industry, and by the way, there are industries that have more risk of these practices happening. And that would be, for example, in the apparel business. It also happens quite commonly in agriculture. So again, another example, a great example would be if you have, for example, children working on the family farm, is that child labor or or is it not? Because they're literally following the family business and have for generations. So again, it's another good example of where it happens. And it may not be something that's looked at as particularly problematic because it's a generational uh, practice that's occurring. But you've got agriculture, you've got the construction industry. So one of the common misperceptions that I hear from CFOs when I talk to them as part of the networks that I'm in is I hear statements like, but it's a third world or a developing economy type of challenge. It's actually not. It's also very much a developed economy problem. And it happens frequently, again, in agriculture. You think about individuals who come around and pick fruit or perhaps they pick uh, vegetables or salads or whatever the case may be depending on, again, the geography we're talking about, it's very hard to keep track of seasonal uh, transient individuals who go from farm to farm or orchard to orchard. How do you keep track to make sure that they're being treated 
fairly and being paid a living wage. Uh, so it's these kinds of things that end up happening. And the construction industry is another one. Uh, there's a real problem with the construction industry, again, in wealthy countries where individuals tend to be undocumented. And unfortunately, when individuals work in an undocumented manner, they tend to be at much higher risk of being abused. And whether that's through the retention of passports, which sometimes happens, and therefore the individuals are prevented from moving, or they're preventing, prevented from assembling, or perhaps even collective bargaining. And you start to realize that when these types of rights are eroded, that's where we start to see these kinds of practices happening. So what can CFOs do? Well, CFOs can look at what their suppliers are doing and make sure that they're helping their suppliers develop the kinds of programs that create a fair, a living, you know, a fair environment to work, good working conditions, good living conditions. And at the same time, we're paying living wages, for example, and that we're treating people in a way that we're respecting them as human beings. So in other words, thinking of this particular subject as a governance issue as opposed to a social issue. So I know I'm talking a lot, but you can hopefully get a sense for, you know, what the, I think what the opportunity is for us as professionals, because we are influencers in our profession, we can influence the C-suite and it's how we make sure that we live up to that responsibility. I agree a hundred percent. Those are fabulous examples that some we had talked through, maybe even a new one in there. Um, And it's unfortunately all too um, common, right? And so how do you see data and governance working in practice to really help tackle some of these issues? Brilliant question. And I think data honestly underlies everything we do. If you think about it, all the way back to the uh, financial crisis back in 2007, 2008, when there was a really significant push and focus on data, data governance. And that was certainly on the financial reporting context. But that challenge continues on the uh, sustainability or ESG side. And you might say, well, why is it so different there? Can't we just leverage what we've done on the financial reporting side? And I would say, yes, we can absolutely leverage what we've learned. We can do things faster, easier, better than we did on the financial side. But what we need to remember is that when it comes to financial reporting, most of the financial data that we create, use, or produce is done within the company. So it's very easy to put controls around what we do within an organization because we basically control inputs, processes, and outputs. When we talk about ESG-related data, most of that data comes from outside the company, comes from suppliers, and it comes from other third parties. So it changes the way we need to think about it to say, well, okay, how do we make sure that we've got governance around the data collection process, the validation process, and make sure that we understand, for example, if artificial intelligence was used to either cleanse the data or aggregate the data or potentially Mm -hmm. uh, draw judgments on the data that we're receiving from an upstream party, for example, how do we make sure we understand that and that we've got controls around that? And that's what I think makes this space so interesting when it comes to data governance and data management is it needs, I think, a slightly different way of thinking, but one that almost goes back to the fundamentals. But again, fundamentals being it's not all within our control. So how do we get comfortable with what happens somewhere else when it's not always evident? So what can those listening do if they haven't already been thinking about this? Um, You know, I, I think... There's probably aspects of it that have been thought through, but what are some of those things that you think you can suggest um, that that our listeners can do in their own organizations? Really good um, way, I think, of asking the question is to say, okay, two things. One, what's going on? So I hosted a, a roundtable of CFOs virtually some weeks ago absolutely brilliant CFOs of large organizations, well-seasoned. And we were talking about modern slavery, as we were just talking a little bit earlier about. And all of the individuals, as we had this group conversation together and just sharing and creating more awareness, every single one of them said, I need to go back and see what our organization is doing. So I think the first part is just being aware from this podcast and what we're talking about here just being aware of the issue and starting to ask questions, saying, hey, what do we do? 
you know, how do we do due diligence on our suppliers? How do we help our suppliers in high risk industries or high risk countries? And, you know, sometimes I hear statements like, but we just won't do business with certain suppliers. And that's something, you know, I can absolutely understand that response. But at the same time, we've got to remember that if we pull away, one of two things could potentially happen. One is we leave individuals that work for that supplier without mm -hmm. a job. So we actually could end up compounding some of those challenges. That's one possibility. The second one is another actor steps in and perhaps doesn't have the ethical mindset that we do. And therefore, actually, the situation could become worse. So part of, I think, the way we, we can think about it is think about, OK, how do I end up taking the successes that I've had as a company and how do I bring them to other cultures in a way that supports a natural transition? So I think what's really important is that we don't go in telling, but we go in supporting and that we go in educating and making sure that when we talk about things like a living wage, it's the recognition of we need to make sure that human beings can put a roof over their head, food on the table, you know, basic things, things that everyone should have the right to be able to do and not worry about. So I think just being aware is the is the first one. Asking questions, mm -hmm. I think, is the next. And then I would say probably thirdly, get involved. Find ways of getting involved. There are many NGOs that are looking for volunteers on a variety of initiatives that they run. You know, look to get involved in some initiatives and see what you can do to help. Start to become a champion of the dialogue and start sharing the perspective and saying, hey, let me do the little bit I can do to make sure that we move in a positive direction. I, those are fabulous points, David. I think awareness is first and foremost, but your points on not simply just walking away and not supporting those organizations that may be either participating in or, um, you know, actually have that modern slavery in their businesses today, but actually taking action against it and doing something about it, but in a way where um, we're informed. I think another area that you can really impart a lot of um, insight to is around a recent blog post that you had, and it's around seizing leadership moments. And it's all about recognizing moments of growth and potential and knowing how to use all of that in our favor. And so when it comes to the future of revenue accounting, of accounting, what can we as leaders do to ensure that we're seizing those moments and it, as well, like just not just for ourselves, but also for employees? Can you speak to that? Absolutely. So I think when I talk about seizing the moment, part of what I mean by that is looking forward. So there's, there are two ways that we can look at things in life. We can either look at the way we did, we did it in the past or the way we think it should be done based on what we did in the past or the successes we had in the past. So the challenge with that backward looking view is it holds us there. And everything we then do is anchored in the past. And that actually becomes a limitation. So if we take more of a perspective to say, okay, here's where we stand today. What can I do moving forward? So really looking at it without being tethered to what happened in the past and really therefore being free to explore, to take risks, to try things, some things won't work. It's a little bit like the analogy uh, I, most listeners have probably heard certainly is one, and, and maybe I'm going to date myself a little bit now, but it's this idea of you take spaghetti and you throw it on the wall and you see what sticks. So that's a little, that's a little bit of what I mean is just try stuff. It's not all going to work. It's okay. You know, sometimes the things that we try that don't succeed are the things we get the best learning from. So seizing the moment to me is about looking forward, trying stuff, adapting, learning, being agile and saying, whatever happens right now, I can either be part of the solution, hence looking forward, or I can become part of the problem. And I think when we talk about seizing to me, it's always about looking at how we can be part of the solution, not part of the problem. I love the idea of progress in light of failure, right? If you don't take risks and you don't try new things, you're never going to be able to grow. And so I think it's something important that, especially in accounting, sometimes we get a little bit too comfortable 
in what we know, right? And I think there's something certainly um, that we can all learn around taking those risks, trying new things, embracing that, and being able to learn from from anything that we get out of it, but really certainly seizing those moments. I love that. So I have a final question for you, mm-hmm. and it kind of is an intersection of a few things we've talked about, but curious your perspective, especially with seizing those moments, right? Thinking ahead in what the future of accounting might look like, what's your perspective on where humans and technology intersect and what that might look for the future of accounting? That's a brilliant question. And I think it's one that evokes a lot of emotion for many people. Mm -hmm. So there's really a spectrum of reactions, but you've got one spectrum of people that start to look at any kind of artificial intelligence as really threatening. Um, it's going to displace humanity, it's but it's going to take over humanity. So a little bit like a James Cameron film uh, type of concept, <laughs> right? So that's certainly one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is looking at it incredibly optimistically, almost with rose-colored glasses to say, look, everything is fabulous. There are no risks. There are no issues. And and again, that's the the other side, which is a very, very positive, but certainly another extreme. Mm -hmm. And then you've got everything in the middle. And I think when we talk about what's going to happen to our profession, I absolutely believe there's going to be an intersection with the work that humans do and with how technology will support, not necessarily displace or replace. I think it will replace some activities, but it won't replace human beings as a whole. What it will mean is that as humans, we need to adapt what we do. So where we'll see technology, for example, replacing repetitive tasks, great. You know, most people would look at that and see that as a fantastic outcome. But (laughs) again, (laughs) absolutely. But let's remember that there are many individuals in different parts of the world that do do repetitive activities. So part of what we've got to think about is how do we help transition individuals that are going to be impacted, whether that's in an organization or in a community, how do we prepare them for what's coming? How do we prepare them to be more, for example, computer aware? And again, that sounds really easy, but we also have to remember that there's a significant part of the population that's not digitally connected today at all. Mm -hmm. So you've got this really interesting, I think, dynamic that's going on around, but I think part of it for us is just recognizing there is a change that's underway. It is not going to stop. It's a necessary part of change, like the Industrial Revolution. If we think about when cars came to be or computers came to be, you can imagine there were very similar conversations back then about the sky is falling, the world is ending, and, you know, it's going to change everything. But I think here as we fast forward and we think about how much easier our lives have been made in many respects, how many more opportunities there are for really interesting work, you know, we would on balance... I would say probably most people would say it's been a very positive thing. How do we make sure that we don't repeat the errors of the past and that we prepare communities for better change? We prepare young people through university programs, for example. You know, even university programs need to be thought of quite differently or high school. You know, just getting kids ready much more quickly so that when they move into this world and, you know, the world starts to evolve as it naturally does, So part of this is teaching kids to be agile, to be much more adaptable to change, much more resilient to change. And that's not something we're teaching today. So Mm -hmm. that's a big part of, you know, when you ask me, how do all of these things intersect for me and and why does leadership matter? It's because of that. There are so many skills that I think are so, so critical to success, not only in, in enterprise, but certainly in life. And we don't spend enough time teaching them. Uh, You know, I think we've just uncovered our next um, podcast topics. I'm going to have to have you back because I could talk to you all day long about these things, but you make fabulous points around, you know, everything you've kind of talked about today is really around something outside of ourselves. And I think it's a really interesting point of view that we need to make sure we maintain as leaders in the industry. There are things, even when it comes to, you know, we we get nervous about AI and what does that mean? But there's so many people in the world that we need to be responsible for as well. So, so many great points, David. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a true pleasure chatting with you as always. And I look forward to having you back again. Thank you. Um, I've loved it and I will come back anytime. Wonderful. Thanks again. Thank you. 
This podcast is brought to you by Zora Revenue. Automate revenue recognition for any business model, enabling your teams to reconcile and report on revenue in real time. Listeners, my DMs are always open to you. Please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn at mdaigle, that's E-M-D-A-I-G-L-E, and follow me for insights that help accounting leaders grow in their career, modernize their teams, and ultimately become more influential partners in business. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.